Hello friends, I am Al Wayman, and welcome to another episode of Religion Think. And if you have a passion for religious literature, then this is the show for you. I am an armchair scholar who loves to read, and loves to read about metaphors and mythology. And hopefully this show will help you be able to rebuild the metaphor in your life and appreciate once more the value of religious literature. Greetings friends, we have an exciting show today. Today we're going to be talking about the text, the Ugaritic text found at Rosh Shemara. We're going to be talking about the Baal epic. And we're going to take all of that and compare it to Jewish literature from the Tanakh or the Old Testament. So please stick around and watch our show and maybe you can appreciate the literature once more and be able to get something out of it either if it's for your belief system, your Bible study, or if you just would like background and knowledge about the environment of the ancient Near East and the beautiful literature that sprang out of those environments. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So, so here we are discussing the text of uh, Rosh Hashemara and, and, and the Baal epic. And uh, the archaeological site of Rosh Hashemara was probably one of the most important finds because now um, we, we have a lot of the word usage um, that we never even knew about uh, or word meanings from Hebrew uh, from the context in, in cuneiform, from, from, from Ugarit, we can look and see and compare them to uh, Hebrew text and uh, find meaning, uh, word meanings on them. And, and, and now we know what, what these old, old words may have meant or, or how they were used. And what's really interesting is that the find is really important because here you have a large library being dug up that were people who were neighbors of the Hebrews. So it makes it that much more important and they have contributed a lot to understanding biblical literature and it is it is very important. And, and the Baal epic uh, is very important because in the Baal epic you have episodes of uh, uh, the fight with the sea, uh, the fight with death, and, 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 and the creator Yahweh Judaism uh, participated in such fights and we find uh, such things in the Psalms uh, discussing these fights where Yahweh is seen as the warrior God. So um, the finds at the library of Rosh Mara have probably contributed quite a bit to understanding um, Hebrew literature and uh, Bible archaeology as it stands today. Probably one of the most misunderstood ideas about the uh, Ugaritic text compared to the biblical literature is that people with motives end up influencing the idea of the literature. Those who are of belief systems try to minimize the contributions made by the Canaanites into the biblical text and those who are against religion try to maximize the influence. So it's very important to read scholars, find out what the scholars are reading, then go back and look at those sources, and then see for yourself. So what's interesting here is if, if you read the first part of Judges, when the Hebrews in the early tribal league is claiming the land, they were told to wipe out everybody 
this literature springs from a very violent culture, but you read in the literature and judges, that does not happen. And a lot of these tribes were simulated in with the early tribal league. And so when the tribes assimilate the Canaanites, the Canaanite ideas are integrated into the cult of Yahweh. So what's interesting is in Psalms, uh, for example, 29, Psalms 82, Song of the Sea, Exodus 15, you see a lot of interesting things going on where hymns of Baal are converted into the language of the early Yahweh cult. So, to say that one religion steals, plagiarizes, or borrows um, is probably an over-exaggeration, meaning that in every culture, everything is built on the old. And cultural diffusion, borrowing, giving and taking from each other is common in all religions and can be found in most any idea, even dealing with non-religious issues. So it's important not to over-exaggerate or undervalue the contributions made. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to look at some of those contributions and bring out and highlight some of those ideas and try to be responsible about it. So when we look at the pantheon of the Canaanites, you have a four-tier pantheon. At the top, you have El, who was the head deity, who by now, uh, by the time we get to the uh, Baal epic, he doesn't have that much influence. However, uh, from the text, we can gather that they still need permission, the, the gods still need permission uh, from him for some unknown reason uh, to do things. So they still need to ask permission. He has long white beard, white hair, and he resides at the source of the two rivers. We have Asherah, queen of the sea, uh, his wife, who later on ends up becoming associated with goddesses like Ishtar and Astarte, um, and plays the role as a fertility goddess. And she shows up in the prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah especially, um, complain about the worship of uh, Asherah and the Asherah cult and the Asherah poles, which is, is pretty interesting. Then we have uh, the son and daughter. Um, there's probably more, but in the Baal epic that, that we're, we're looking at, uh, there's Anit, the war goddess, who is the daughter of Asherah. And then there is Baal. Um, he is the rider of the clouds and the uh, god of lightning and rain. So what's interesting is, as time progressed, all the attributes of El and all the attributes of Baal were combined into the god Yahweh. And what was interesting is, at times it became confusing uh, because the deities were so much alike. And Yahweh, as we know in uh, kings had to change from being this warrior god of, of earthquakes and wind and fire. He had to change to the still small voice. And that was all in retaliation to um, Canaanite ideas um, saturating the early is Israeli uh, Yahweh cult, which infuriated the uh, priestly caste because uh, they tried and tried to uh, purge the belief system of any influence of Canaanite um, ideas and religion. So in the Ugaritic literature, we clearly find a four-tier pantheon of the deities, or of the gods, and this idea was clearly carried over into the ideas of Yahwehism which is really interesting. Here you had Yahweh as the top god. Underneath him were helper gods, such as Satan, and different messenger gods, maybe angels, 
and in Kings, we find the text where the heavenly council was convening on who would go to Ahab and lie to Ahab. So, so all this is really interesting. Next, next here under that would be the deity who would heal people from plagues. Uh, an example of this would be the graven image that Moses put up so the people could look upon it and be healed. So that may have been a deity to heal. And also the king would be the bottom level who was chosen by Yahweh. Also counteracted with the prophet who was the spokesperson of Yahweh. So there's clearly a four-tier pantheon on the way things were done. And eventually things were combined and moved around over the years until you have what we have today and our concept of the Hebrew and Christian pantheon. And still there are different levels uh, with different deities or different beings forming different functions. So when you look back on it, it's all very interesting because you can see a lot of the influences that were integrated into, no matter how much people would like to uh, deny that. So in the Baal Epic, um, we start off with, for some reason, El, the, the, the uh, god, the head of the pantheon, ends up um, awarding the god, the sea god Yom, uh, giving him, turning over him, over to him uh, leadership, uh, and he demands uh, a temple to be built. And El, uh, the head deity of the pantheon, um, calls the, the uh, craftsman deity, or the worker deity, Kathor Wahathis, uh, and tells him to build Yom a palace. And so Yom ends up becoming a ruler of the gods. Uh, it, it's kind of humorous because it seems that uh, El is retiring. Um, Yom is a very hard ruler and he makes, so to speak, slaves out of the other gods. And they are complaining about it. And so they go to Asherah, the, the, the sea goddess, the goddess of the sea, El's wife, and they say to her, go to Yom and plead our case. So she goes to Yom. Yom would not let up. And so she offers herself in replacement for the freedom of the gods. And this is quite fascinating, and this whole, this whole deity, I mean, this whole idea of um, offering oneself up for the many is really interesting. And, and the idea that the gods were in slavery, in, in tyranny, and um, later they will have to fight Yom, the sea, to be removed from that. You see uh, quite a bit of this happening, or, or the same motif occurring, not exactly, but you see it occurring in the idea of... Um, the Exodus in the Hebrews, uh, in the Hebrew epic, and, and what's really interesting about this is Baal uh, would not have any of it, and he gets really upset, and he goes to the council, and, and what's really uh, great about it, he gives this big long speech um, and chastises the other gods. So here already at the beginning of the epic, we find opposition to tyranny, the giving of one for the many, and issues dealing with the battle with the sea. So here, this text can be compared to Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh, leading up to the drowning of the Egyptians in the sea and overcoming of the sea god. because. The Song of the Sea, Exodus 15, um, that's clearly what it seems to be about. The Hebrews rejoice that Yahweh overcame the sea. Now 
the gods were sitting to eat, the holy ones for to dine, Baal attending upon El. As soon as the gods espy them, espy the messengers of Yom, the envoys of Judge Nahar, the gods do drop their heads down upon their knees and on the thrones of their princeship. Them doth Baal rebuke. Why, O gods, have ye dropped your heads down upon your knees and on your thrones of princeship? I see the gods are coward. With terror are the messengers of Yom, of the envoys of Judge Nahar. Lift up, O gods, your heads from upon your knees, from upon the thrones of your princeship. And I'll answer the messengers of Yom, the envoys of Judge Nahar. The gods lift up their heads from upon their knees, from upon their thrones of princeship. God presides in the great assembly. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak, the poor, and the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They don't know, neither do they understand. They walk back and forth in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said you are gods. All of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like men and fall like one of the rulers. Arise, God, judge the earth, for you inherit all of the nations. So after Baal addresses the Heavenly Council, chastises the god and says, stand up to Yom. El seems to give Baal over pretty quick. And he tells the servants who come to the heavenly council to claim Baal, yes, he'll come quietly, don't worry, and I'll send him along with the gifts and tribute that I am sending to your god, or to Yom. So Baal goes to Yom. However, Kathor Wahasis says, don't worry, you're going to be awesome, and you're going to be victorious over the sea. And Kathor Wahasis makes two clubs called Chaser and Driver, uh, which are probably two word puns, which you see used a lot in Hebrew writings, word puns. So, Baal has a fierce battle with Yom, the sea god, and they struggle back and forth. Neither, neither one can overcome the other, so finally Baal uses the club uh, chaser, uses the club driver, and hits Yom between the eyes and drives him from the throne. So now Baal is king, and in celebration holds a big banquet and later demands a temple to be built because in ancient Near Eastern text the only way that you can claim legitimacy is if you have a temple and this also held true uh, to the Hebrews where at first Yahweh uh, was upset at the idea of building a temple because he said I have always dwelt with my people as wanderers in a tent structure and now you want a temple but as we know later, in order to claim legitimacy in the competition of the deities, he, also, he almost needed a temple uh, to be a legitimate god. So, that's the story of Baal and the sea. What's interesting is that the Hebrew word for sea is yam. And there's some beautiful, beautiful speeches inside of the Baal epic. And just to fight with the sea is not the end of the Baal epic, just part of it. Because later on, Baal uh, ends up fighting uh, death. So very interesting indeed.
Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host has he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are sunk in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, Lord, dashes the enemy in pieces. In the greatness of your excellency, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your wrath. It consumes them. The flood stood upright as a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You and your loving kindness have led the people that you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have taken hold on the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. Trembling takes hold of the mighty men of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan are melted away. Terror and dread falls on them. By the greatness of your arm they are as still as a stone. Until your people pass over, Lord, until the people pass over who you have purchased, you shall bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, which you have made for yourself to dwell in, the sanctuary, Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the children of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dances. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea.